Now we go into class two. As you can see, most of the beta blockers end in LOL. No, that's not funny. I wish it was. All the ones listed are non-selective beta blockers. They block beta-1 and beta-2 receptors, except which two drugs? Metoprolol. This is also a big high yield fact. This is a pure beta-1 antagonist, which explains its unique side effect profile. Beta-1 receptors induce lipolysis in adipose tissue. If you block beta-1 receptors in adipose tissue, then you increase the risk for dyslipidemia because you are going to block the ability of those adipocytes to release free fatty acids. They just store all this fat and they increase your risk for dyslipidemia. Now, another one on here is carvitolol. This is a rather unique drug because in addition to beta-1 and beta-2 blockade, it also has an alpha-1 blockade element. Beta blockers are great drugs if you want to alter the conductivity in places that the heart has a particularly high level of autonomic nervous system activity. We're talking about the SA in the AV node. Let's look at this figure real quick to see what I'm talking about. Check out this slide. Looks super familiar to us. We've already seen this. We know it from the physiology section. Now beta blockers are going to be competing here with epi or norepinephrine at this beta-1 receptor. By inhibiting this receptor, we do not stimulate adenylocyclase and we do not produce more cyclic AMP. Now do you remember the funny current channels that are responsible for the baseline depolarization of pacemaker cells. Remember, cyclic AMP binds those channels to increase the rate at which they open. So if we drive down the amount of cyclic AMP available, we're also going to drive down the funny current because those channels will open less. In addition to that, this drop in cyclic AMP also limits the liberation of protein kinase A. Without an active protein kinase A, these L-type calcium channels are not phosphorylated and they do not open as well. We also severely decrease the slope of phase 4 depolarization because we're going to decrease the calcium influx. Remember, calcium influx needs to bind this ryanidine receptor to increase the liberation of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. We can see that here in this diagram. Here we can see how phase 4 has been stretched out and the slope is even more flat. This is because we decrease the activity of the calcium channels responsible for the upstroke of pacemaker cells. So why are patients on beta blockers sometimes diagnosed with first degree AV block? This is because the beta receptor blockade decreases the conductance through the AV node. This can sometimes show up as an increased PR interval. You see that on the ECG and you think maybe this person's on a beta blocker. Now an excess of this block can lead to side effects such as severe bradycardia, even AV block, or potentially acute heart failure if you severely depress their heart. If you decrease the ability of the conduction system to depolarize, then you cause a very sharp decrease in the heart rate leading to a bradycardia. If you prevent the AV node from conducting impulses, you can have AV block. And if the cardiac depression gets severe enough, you can even lead to full-blown heart failure. Now classically, beta blockers have been associated with impotence. You need to know this because men aren't just going to ask for sildenafil or a similar drug to maintain an erection. These patients are just going to stop taking their beta blocker so they can turn this around and maintain an erection or have ejaculation. Now, also as important as the erectile dysfunction, beta blockers can exacerbate COPD or asthma and they can actually trigger vasospasm, particularly in the situation of Prince Metal Angina. Now, I group these together because they all have the same mechanism of toxicity. Beta-2 adrenergic antagonism triggers vascular smooth muscle cell contraction. You remember this diagram? Let's talk about the side effect of bronchospasm and vasospasm. Non-selective beta blockers, such as propranolol, block beta-1 receptors in the heart, but they also block beta-2 receptors found in vascular smooth muscle cells and in smooth muscle cells of the bronchioles. So if we're talking about the coronary arteries in particular and the bronchioles. If you block beta-2 receptors, what does the smooth muscle in the airways do? And what does the smooth muscle in the coronary arteries do? Well, you get contraction. The muscle contracts because the beta-2 receptor here on the membrane is blocked from activation. The G stimulatory protein associated with the beta-2 receptor will also be inhibited. It will not tell adenylocyclase to liberate protein kinase A. 
by producing cyclic AMP. An inactive protein kinase A is bad because an active protein kinase A normally inhibits myosin light chain kinase by slapping on a phosphate group. So if myosin light chain kinase is not inhibited because the patient is taking a non-selective beta blocker, the myosin is going to be phosphorylated and now we're going to get contraction due to cross bridging. This is a problem because it can trigger smooth muscles in the bronchioles or the arteries to spasm and no one likes having difficulty breathing and the myocardium does not like having difficulty receiving blood. So how do we treat bronchospasm? Well, same way we treat asthma flare-ups. We reverse it. We give them a beta-2 agonist. Classic beta-2 agonist is albuterol. We do this to relax the smooth muscle lining of the bronchioles. Now, in patients with COPD or asthma, they already have a high level of bronchial inflammation. The last thing you want to do is block the ability of smooth muscles to relax and help open up the airways. Now, in the case of the coronary arteries, when we're talking about Prince metal angina, this is characterized by coronary artery vasospasm top-notch terrible idea would be to inhibit the ability of the coronary artery smooth muscle cells to relax. Now what are some other high yield side effects associated with these drugs? How about something we all experience as medical students? Sedation and changes in our sleep-wake cycles. The key here is that the sympathetic nervous system is a key component of the reticular activating system. Big word. You don't really have to know it. The only thing you have to know is that this helps keep us alert. And it is also responsible for slow wave sleep. Now beta blockers knock out this component of the reticular activating system. We lose that sympathetic nervous system component and this leads to changes in sleep-wake cycles. It causes the person to be more sedated. The same situation can be said for the super high yield concept that we can accidentally mask the signs of hypoglycemia. You better know the presentation of a hypoglycemic patient because that's how you're gonna be tested on the side effect. A hypoglycemic patient will be impaired or potentially have a loss of consciousness because the brain needs glucose to function properly. Now, how's the brain going to respond to a person that's hypoglycemic? Well, they're going to ramp up the sympathetic nervous system. Why are they going to do that? They want to tap in to those glycogen stores. Catecholamines, particularly epinephrine, bind beta receptors of the liver to stimulate gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis. This helps to increase or maintain blood glucose levels. Patients on beta blockers are taking a medication that antagonizes this catecholamine response. So not only do we exacerbate the hypoglycemia by preventing the elevation of blood sugar levels by compensatory mechanisms such as glycogenolysis, we're also going to mask the clinical signs of hypoglycemia. So what signs are we talking about? The signs are the ones we would expect for an increase in sympathetic nervous system outflow. These are tremor, anxiety, tachycardia, palpitations, midriasis, pallor, and coldness. The beta blocker we have, just given the patient, will compete with catecholamines at all of these effector tissue sites. This is the problem. We hide the constellation of signs that would tip us off to their hypoglycemic state to begin with. Systemic beta blockade can also be very dangerous if you give them to a patient suffering from cocaine toxicity or someone that has a pheochromocytoma. Why? Well, cocaine, which you see here, blocks the reuptake of catecholamines back into the synaptic cleft. This increases the amount of catecholamines available in the system. Here we have an image of a pheochromocytoma. Remember, pheos are tumors arising from the chromaffin cells. These are neurocrest cell derived cells in the medulla of our adrenal glands. They are secreting tons of catecholamines. So taking a bunch of cocaine, or having a pheochromocytoma, these both lead to very high levels of alpha-1, alpha-2, and beta-2 agonist activity. You should never give someone a non-selective beta blocker because these patients are in severe danger of hypertension if you knock out beta-2 receptors. Remember, this leads to the loss of beta-2 mediated vasodilatation. So what are we left with? Well, we get unopposed alpha-1 mediated vasoconstriction and this is going to drive the blood pressure through the roof because cardiac output times systemic vascular resistance is our equation and we are severely increasing the SVR. Now how do we treat this overdose? Someone that gets a beta blocker overdose needs to get saline. Now why do we give them saline? 
Well, first of all, we're worried about a severe drop in cardiac output. So we need to reverse this by giving them intravascular fluid. We give them IV fluids to increase the blood pressure. This gives us time to fix the underlying problem. Now, glucagon is a great way to counteract this and also treat an overdose because it is a potent stimulator of glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis. This will help also raise the blood glucose levels in addition to reversing the beta blockade. This is also because glucagon activates G protein receptors in the heart. Remember, this leads to activation of adenocyclase, and this turns up the production of cyclic AMP. We know that an increase in cyclic AMP will eventually lead to an increase in heart rate. So why would we give someone atropine? Well, in a beta blocker overdose, there is such severe decrease in sympathetic nervous activity on the heart that we need to do the opposite. We need to prevent uninhibited parasympathetic nervous activity from causing severe SA or AV note blockade. So atropine helps reverse this by knocking down some of the parasympathetic nervous system output on the heart. Remember this, atropine will help us here because it is a muscarinic antagonist. Okay, that was a B slide. Let's move on next to the class three. For the class three, we're talking about evaluating potassium channel blockers. These are amiodarone, ibutilide, dofidilide, and sodalol. Now, here's our diagram again. All of these bind potassium channels responsible for phase three repolarization. This will lead to a delay or prolongation of our phase three. This leads to an increase in action potential and also increases the effective refractory period. Anytime we prolong the repolarization, we're also going to increase the risk for QT prolongation that can lead to that deadly French arrhythmia we're talking about torsade de points. Now these drugs are useful in the treatment of obliterating re-entry circuits. Now what does this term mean? Re-entry circuits are the causes of AFib, atrial flutter, or a even deadlier arrhythmia, ventricular tachycardia. So this is what we're talking about when we're talking about re-entry circuits. These are little tiny loops of depolarization that circle back on themselves. They just keep going round and round and round over and over. The reason that this occurs is because the myocytes next to each other have different refractory periods. So when one area at this arrow tip has finished depolarizing, the other one directly next to it here at the tail is going to finish repolarizing. They can just continue to loop around on themselves because they're always depolarizing and repolarizing at different times. Class 3 antiarrhythmics help us terminate this loop because they increase the effective refractory period of myocytes that are part of the re-entry circuit. So when this depolarization loop is coming around again, boom, it hits an area of myocytes that are now affected by this class 3 and they're still in their refractory period. This prevents the circuit from continuing to circle back on itself and we obliterate the abnormal depolarization rhythm. Now because amiodarone is the most used drug in this class, and it has a high yield side effect profile, we're going to talk about it first because it's going to be on your exam. So amiodarone is very lipophilic and it is metabolized very slowly by the liver. And then it is excreted by the skin, the bile, and in the lacrimal glands in the form of tears. So just knowing the metabolism and the excretion can help you remember that it can lead to patotoxicity, it can actually lead to corneal or skin deposits. So amiodarone can act as a haptin, which means that it can trigger a sensitivity-like reaction. This one in the lungs, it leads to a pneumonitis, and one in the skin, it leads to a photodermatitis. The photodermatitis appears as inflamed blue skin. Now what about this thyroid toxicity? So check out how there's two little iodine atoms in the structure of amiodarone that we're looking at right here. Now, which organ in our body takes up and uses lots of iodine? How about the thyroid? So, amiodarone will get taken up into the thyroid, where it can then cause a direct toxic effect on the thyroid follicular cells. So, cell damage to those thyroid follicular cells will lead to a release of T3 and T4, and initially, this can present as a hyperthyroid patient. But as the thyroid inflammation continues, we're going to use up all the T3 and T4, and the thyroid, because it's inflamed, isn't making anymore. Now the patient can be hypothyroid. This is because the thyroid is inflamed, burned out, not making anything. So, another high yield thing 
is that the ability of amiodarone to cause a pneumonitis can eventually lead to pulmonary fibrosis. It can also cause hepatotoxicity leading to an elevation in liver function tests such as AST and LOT, and it can cause an abnormal thyroid function test. All right, so what about the neurological effects? Constipation and cardiovascular depression. Amiodarone is not limited to the class reaction, meaning that it has more than just potassium channel blockade ability. It is also capable of blocking the fast sodium channels. This can lead to neurological effects such as paresthesias and weaknesses or other potential side effects related to neuronal sodium channel conductance. Now, calcium channel blockade of the smooth muscle in the interstitial cells of Cajal can lead to constipation. Calcium channel antagonism in the SA and AV node can lead to bradycardia, heart block, or even heart failure. Remember, amiodarone has the action of all of the different antiarrhythmics. So amiodarone isn't the only one that lacks channel or receptor selectivity. Sotalol is an antiarrhythmic that is made up of two stereoisomers. This is D and L. Not important, but it's going to explain why this also acts as a beta blocker. The L isomer can act as a beta blocker it competes to antagonize beta adrenergic receptors, and the D isomer acts as a potassium channel blocker. Sotolol is given as a mixture of these two. This is why you need to watch out for these side effects. All right, great. Now we can finish up with the discussion of the class four calcium channel blockers.